Good morning, Edmund, and welcome to King's Lynn. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Um, before we go into detail and talk about your own work, I'd just like to ask you about painters that you admire and how they might have inspired you. Well, one of the painters that I enjoy and have for quite some time is uh, Charles Sheeler, who's an American painter from the 30s, who is of a tradition of painting um, the industry uh, that developed in America at a particular time and finding a real aesthetic value in mechanical objects and very functional things, uh, that there's a beauty to be found in these things that were not created as aesthetic things, but really more as something that uh, performs a function on a utilitarian purpose. Um, another artist that I enjoy, uh, who's a painter, but actually also does some um, sculptural work, is uh, Via Salmons, who um, does a, a fair amount of painting of realist uh, work, um, a lot of objects that is something that appeals to me, mechanical things, and is so dedicated to realist perfection that she has a series of sculptural pieces that will replicate um, things in the natural world. She'll make her own rocks that look exactly like real rocks that'll be constructed out of other materials that she'll paint. And really, you can't tell the difference between the subject, which will be a real rock that she's got in front of her, and then something that she's recreated. And that sort of obsessive dedication to me is really fascinating and something that uh, is sort of directs my work. Um, and I've always considered her as uh, somebody to aspire to. The work that you're displaying here in King's Lynn it's kind of includes two elements really, the cameras obviously, which are dominant, and then you've got these, this odd, um, kind of odd dichotomy with the, the kind of weaponry or the rockets or bullets. Um, can you explain the relationship that you see between these, what for the members of the public I think might be two seemingly disparate areas of interest and how they come together? Yeah, I think the disparity to me is interesting. Uh, something. Uh, an object that's used to create uh, versus an object that's used to destroy. Uh, but aesthetically, they're very similar. There's a geometric structure that they share. There's a process of um, creating them, a, a mechanical uh, industry that exists that sort of you can shift over from peacetime and making cameras to wartime to making bullets or rockets that uh, that they're very they're being just as similar they're they're quite desperate at the same time so I find that that's um, an interesting comparison and something to uh, to uh, to present as a juxtaposition and I think you've said before about the idea of the camera shooting. Mm -hmm. a, a shot. And yeah, a, a, yeah. Know, there's great power yeah. in the the, so the object, a, a machine that can that can shoot something that captures space or captures, for some people, a, a soul, uh, and uh, the um, the weapon, which uh, essentially does the same thing. It's used to capture space and, and you know can take a soul. And what is it exactly about the magnification of, say, a domestic-sized object to these vast scales that you do that really appeals to you? Well, in terms of presentation, as a painter, I think you always want some kind of dynamic appeal. And so an oversized uh, painting is, is always something that's going to have a great impact. And, you know, as an artist, you like that sort of response. Um, the objects themselves, to me, have a great appeal in their tactile quality. And sometimes that's difficult to capture, probably as a, a painting at scale. Um, and I've thought of my work sometimes in the tradition of, um, of a still life trompe l'oeil. But to break out of that mold, um, it's uh, the tendency I usually have is to um, build up the size probably about 500 
or uh, uh, ten times the amount, or five times the the size the actual object is going to be. Um, and in that way, I feel like I can really capture the light, color, and, and the texture in a way that I probably wouldn't have an opportunity to do otherwise. I paint in oils, and painting uh, in a very hyper-realist way in oils is a bit of a challenge because oils build up paint, and then you start to lose details. So uh, the larger you go, the easier it is to then achieve some level of detail and still have the quality that oil can provide. So I think that's the, the thank you the largest painting here, um, the sort of exploded camera diagram painting, is I mean just sensational because of its scale. It, it has the wow factor. So I can see what you're saying. You must have quite a large studio, one imagines, to paint something of that scale. I always wish it was larger. All oh, right. Um, and what I did for that particular piece was to uh, staple an unstretched canvas to the largest wall in my studio and pretty much devote uh, most of the space to creating that piece. I try and work on a couple of paintings at uh, a time because otherwise it can be a little monotonous to just work from beginning to end on one painting. But something of that scale really requires the attention uh, to continue and be consistent with my palette and you know the whole process rather than sort of jumping back and forth so my whole studio was all about that painting for about three months. Okay, I was going to ask you in general how long are you spending on a painting? Obviously that large one you said two to three months but you know some of the smaller paintings here are they are they done over a consistent period of time and you finish them or you say you're starting about between? Yeah, it depends. I would say on average probably about 100 hours, 100 to 200 hours depending on the scale of the work. And I consider the planning that goes into creating the work. Uh, I do a lot of uh, line drawing ahead of time because I'm very precise about how uh, the placement is on the canvas and more these days I'm doing work on paper, which um, requires me to, to be extremely precise about placement and uh, how, I, how to go about you know, painting things. So it's very set before I go into it and I consider the time uh, planning the work as well. So how do you know when to stop? Um, I guess I should say that I really can't help myself. <laughs> uh, it's, yeah. it's sort of my nature in creating the work. I've had people suggest to me that I need to loosen up, but it's really not my nature. So I think an artist has to express themselves in a way that's very natural to them, and that's my natural process. Uh, when I do some drawing, that allows me to loosen up, but when it comes to the final product, I'm just a perfectionist and I can't help it. I think we would all say we're very grateful that you are oh, because it's, you. it's brought to us this amazing exhibition. I'm going to move on now to the um, camera sculptures. Mm. Um, I mean, they're absolutely exquisite and they're new, I know, for you. These wonderful objects are, are sort of being assembled in front of our eyes. Can you just talk a little bit about those and um, what they are and what they mean to you? Yeah, <clears throat> as a as a person who spends an awful lot of time painting, as I said, it can sometimes be monotonous and being an artist, you, it does allow you some freedoms. My work I consider to be sculptural in a sense. Um, the images completely take up the canvas and are very much based on some geometric forms and very volumetric. So, making the transformation to sculpture is a very natural thing in my mind. I've been painting on paper recently with gouache, and working with the paper makes me think about that uh, medium, and that's really what I've decided to turn to when it came to making these sculptures. I think it's interesting to take uh, a common material, a type of paper, 
just some kind of paint or something and, and turn it into some, an illusion, make an illusion that it's somehow become something else and at first glance people are sort of uh, tricked by that. And I'm, in a way, uh, when I make my paintings, I'm considering that too, that is a very realistic um, image People sometimes don't understand that the work is painting and not photography, so it, I like to give people an opportunity to examine the work and then discover that it's actually something that wasn't what they originally um, imagined it was. Obviously they're oversized, as you've just said, but they're also white, which I find quite interesting because um, you don't normally find white cameras, apart from the, perhaps occasionally the new digital cameras are in all colours, but can you just tell us a bit about why you've chosen to make them in this sort of really shiny white, attractive right. um, objects? Well, the cameras that most mechanical cameras that are around today are enjoyed purely for their aesthetic appeal. They sit on shelves and they're sculptural pieces. I was thinking about them as being sculptural pieces. And to me, the white reflects a uh, disuse of something that um, probably won't be handled because it's uh, impractical to make a real camera something that's white. It starts showing prints and it reflects light and it's not a practical color for it to be um, to employ in manufacturing the camera. So uh, completely contrary to function, I decided that white would be a, an interesting way to present um, this idea of non-function, but also a complete opposite of the thing that it's been that's being depicted, which is an actual camera. Mm. Would you now consider making any of the sort of weaponry in uh, as sculptures? Has that that's an interesting you? question. Um, it's something I might consider. Actually, uh, I've tried to create work. Um, when I can, that includes the two elements together. So it might just be a hybrid between uh, a camera and, um, say, maybe a tank or something uh, that would be an armored piece of camera that is defending itself against the passage of time that makes the object obsolete.